Okay, I started recording. Um. Okay, great. Hmm. So, yeah, what do you want to discuss about today? Uh, I don't know. Um, let's see okay, here. Maybe. Uh, maybe if I share a bit of uh, what I've been learning, it can lead to some discussion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, been, yeah that, will, been, that will work. Um, I've been trying to study uh, Edward Witten's uh, CDO paper. So he has a paper where he describes chiral differential operators using uh using using uh O two supersymmetric model, and I've reached this part where he uses the beta gamma ghost system that goes yeah. uh, the, the goes CFT um and I realized that I I don't know enough of it um specifically he he actually considers the beta gamma ghost CFT on a on a, on CP one. So that means that uh, the the target space the target space is CP one, meaning that yeah. the original manifold is some M, and then every point in the space it maps it into a, onto the block sphere. Um, yeah, and, and and the way he does it is that he has two two two, he has a north north region north hemisphere and southern hemisphere, and yeah. there's some gluing that happens in between. So the usual. Um, exclude the North Pole and exclude the South Pole kind of construction. Oh, and yeah. uh, apparently it's something along the lines of uh, he identifies the mapping by uh, beta prime being the South Southern Hemisphere, something like this. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's what led me to uh, start to, to study a bit more of this beta gamma and uh, because I realized that uh, I, I didn't I didn't know enough of it and I should probably get a bit more context. So I've been trying to study uh, super string theory um hmm. uh yeah but then that led to me realizing that uh, i don't understand enough of spin yeah yeah so i'm gonna go back to study my spin groups to get my fundamentals uh, up yeah. okay yeah and something that's really nice about uh this uh, aside right slightly unrelated is that i i've learned that if you include shrinks in 26 dimensional flat space time right so in yeah. shrinks and flat space time they when you quantize it it leads to a few particles uh, one of it being the graviton, yeah. uh, another one being some, somewhat like EM, somewhat like electromagnetism, and another one being yeah. the dilaton Q. And the, the graviton Q is related to uh, string interactions, if I'm not wrong, yeah. uh, interactions. And then the EM is kind of charged brains and stuff. And the graviton, what's nice about it is that for these cases, when you create, a, the, when you create coherent states of these particles, yeah. Um. You create a coherent state of the graviton. It essentially, essentially, is equivalent to coupling the strings to, uh, curved space time. So in some sense, uh, the when the strings in flat space, they they actually produce particles that kind of cause them to behave like they are in curved space time. So that's right. what they mean by I discovered what they mean by uh, uh, I I better understood what they mean by, the uh, gravity pops out of uh, string theory. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. That was quite cool. Yeah, I just wanted to share. It's quite mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, I guess like yeah, that's uh the usual string theory lore. Um, yeah, this seems like interesting topics. Sigma models mm -hmm. are pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. so these yeah, days okay. I've been doing math. Uh, my plan is to understand uh physics such as quantum field theory and string theory in a mathematically rigorous way and actually do physical mathematics um mm. so yeah so uh yeah i kind of realized that it's easier to do math and then apply my knowledge to physics than to do it the other way around um and <laughs> like if, yeah so these days i've been doing very basic stuff um Let's see here. Uh, hmm, what should I talk about? Mm, yeah. Well, um, the last week we were talking about uh, the last week talking about if I'm not wrong, let me, let me just go back and check a bit. Um, you were talking about uh, renormalize. Oh yeah, yeah, um, we were. You were uh, you were kind of halfway through the normalization, or was that the previous previous week? Um, I I think like what. I know we were like 
doing something, something, renormalization, something. Um, yeah, um, but like, obviously, I'm not going to keep doing that because mm, sure, sure. Yeah, renormalization is not very sure, interesting. Sure. Um, so mm. I'm going to do some stuff. Let's see what I'm going to do. Um, mm. uh, well, um, I guess, well, this is, some people might consider this to be a rather boring topic, but I guess I could talk a little bit more about uh, Hilbert spaces. So. Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's do that today. So a Hilbert space, this is, this is important if you're going to do anything related to quantum mechanics. Uh, so a Hilbert space uh, is like a, a vector is a vector space over uh, the complex number field uh, plus an inner product a b where a and b in h uh, such that a and b is equal to the complex conjugate of b and a. And a C B, where C is complex number, is equal to C A B. And X and X is equal to it's larger than zero if X is not zero. Mm -hmm. Um so um I, I on that note, uh, I've been studying this uh, because uh that there's a lot of uh, problems when in 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 uh gauge theory where the norm uh where goals essentially goals have negative yeah. norm and it seems to always have something to do with uh the fact that it seems to always have to do with the fact that uh there's a gauge degree of freedom that they didn't they didn't remove when quantizing yeah that's like a whole another topic um that has to do with like brsd uh bv formalism mm -hmm. uh, we might get there i still oh, have to like study that in a bit more um mm -hmm. mathematical way um that's like a really important topic that i will probably have to study soon um but anyway mm -hmm. like the basics are important so um mm -hmm. so yeah, that so cool. what i'd like to emphasize is that there is another important condition in the definition of a hilbert space which is cloak which is completeness mm -hmm. uh what does this mean? Well, we can define uh, the norm, uh, which is defined as so, which makes sense because this is larger than or equal to zero. Um, mm -hmm. Then what, what it's saying is that if you have a Cauchy sequence, I'm going to define what a Cauchy sequence is, so don't worry. Uh, a Cauchy sequence is basically a sequence of vectors in H uh, such that for any value of R larger than zero, um, there exists a natural number n uh, such that if m and n are larger than n, then the, the norm between xn and xm is less than r. Mm. So what this implies is that you have a series of vectors. Uh, this could be x1, this could be x2, this could be x3, blah, blah, blah. But as you go further and further, the distance between these, these vectors kind of converge to zero. Um, mm. and by completeness means that every Cauchy sequence has a limit. So mm. there has to exist, um, some X in the Hilbert space such that for every R larger than zero, there is a large, there's a, there's an integer such that if N is larger than N, then the distance between X N and X are less than R. Mm, it means right. that this series has to converge if it is a if it is a Cauchy sequence, and this is actually mm. kind of important. But like, let's see um, the case. Yeah. Yeah, if I may draw a, a example that uh, might might uh, help illustrate this example. Uh, yeah. The 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 space of quote uh, rational numbers are not is not complete because yeah. um it's not complete because uh you can have a bunch of rational numbers that essentially they kind of move towards square root two. Yeah, so, so like one, one point four, one point four five, one point four five. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but one. square root two isn't is not in uh, Q. Yeah. So, 
uh, on the other hand, the set of real numbers is complete um, because square root 2 is in the set of real numbers. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's actually, I think this is something to do with density. Like, it's actually, you want to fail still. Yeah, oh yeah, we're going to get building. there. Sure. Yeah, density yeah. is, so, like, important. Yeah, you can go. Or is it, like, I don't know, it might be a different meaning, but, like, yeah, um, right, so, like, uh, but I like to mention the finite dimensional vector spaces. Well, Dober spaces. Uh, are I or just like isomorphic to CD. This is an exercise that uh, is basically proven in like any basic book. So like, so a vector can be represented as a sequence of numbers and the inner product is given by this. Um, and so you see that all the axioms are satisfied and we're happy. So uh, mm -hmm. if you're just gonna work with finite dimensional vector spaces, uh, you don't really, Hilbert spaces, you don't really have to care about completeness because like they're so simple anyway. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but, but based on my experience, um, if you have a quantum computer, a quantum computer uh, has like a finite number of bits. So if it has 2K bits, um, then the dimension of the Hilbert space well, no, it's not 2k bits, it's k bits, then the dimension of the Hilbert space is 2k to the power of k. Hmm. Um, so in quantum information science, we usually deal with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, so we, so we don't really have to care about completeness. Hmm. Um, but in other more reasonable cases like quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, uh, we do deal with infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Right. Uh, an example is the particle in a box. Um, the particle in a box, if you look at the energy eigenstates, there are an infinite number of energy eigenstates. So the Hilbert mm -hmm. space dimension is infinite. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, like in this case, it's going to be like actually important to consider closure. So I'm going to give like two examples of Hilbert spaces. The first example is the space of um, of a series AI, a complex number, such that, if I recall correctly, uh, converges. Hmm. And the second, uh, second is interesting. It's a space of L two space. I don't know, yeah, L two space, um, which is basically uh, so the space of square integrable functions mm -hmm. in the sense that this is a square Lebesgue integrable. Hmm. So, for example, oh yeah, uh, by the way, like for, oh yeah, okay, so we have ff, then integral of f squared dx uh, converges um, uh, up to, so they're up to, uh, difference uh, all up to a difference in, hmm, let me write this in a different way. So up to an equivalence class, oops. Hmm. And this equivalence class is that basically F and G are equivalent uh, if a f minus g is uh, zero almost everywhere. Hmm. That roughly means uh, in, in the sense the delta that function is zero almost everywhere? The delta function is not a function. Oh, okay. Um, uh, 
I, I did hear about this uh, before, but I forgot what the definition of zero almost the is. The delta function is not in L2, uh, but the delta function is probably in like the dual space. I see. Um, what is the definition of zero almost everywhere? Anyway. Zero almost everywhere uh, is basically saying that if you take a look at this function, then um, so like you can consider the set of the points. I guess you can call this the support. Uh, the set of x uh, so that f minus g x is non-zero. Uh, you can consider this set. You call it s. Um, then the measure of s is zero. I see. So, uh, could it be would, would the example of a uh, uh would x minus two be uh okay I I I I've forgotten. So so an example uh so an example is uh f x equals one if x is rational and zero if x is not rational. This is an example of function that is zero almost everywhere. I see the the measure of the set of all irrational numbers is zero. The measure of the set of all rational numbers is zero. Oh, uh, okay, sure. How about the the set of the measure of the set of all irrational numbers? Uh, then that would be infinity. I see. Okay, it's a it's a measure of a point, a single point. Would be uh, zero. zero. Let me write the definition. Okay, because sure. why not? So the Lebesgue measure uh mu of e where e is a sub uh where e is a subset in R um is given by uh, the infimum um which is basically the infimum of a subset S of a set P. So basically the infimum is basically uh, the greatest number, I don't know, X uh, such that X is less than or equal to um, every number in blah, blah, blah. So the infimum mm. of blah blah blah, where blah blah blah. So infimum is like a lower infimum is like a lower bound. Um, mm. So the infimum of the sum of L I K. Uh, let me just get more space to write this. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Yeah, let me just get a bit more space here. Such that, so IK, or this is like, IK is basically a sequence. It's a sequence of open intervals. So basically, I know, so I have to form like this and that um, with, E in the union of IK. So to illustrate this a little bit, so basically what this is, is that for example, um, if your set, let's give it like a decent example of the set E here. So if we have to realign, and E is mm -hmm. basically uh, this portion, this open interval, um, mm -hmm. with a bunch of like, just like random accountable number of points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, if you were to find IK, so basically IK is a sequence of intervals such that if you take the union of all of them, um, then this, this region E would go in there. So for IK, um, I could choose it's an open interval, so I could choose I one here. Um, I two here. I three here. I four here. Blah blah blah. 
and then we would be looking for the lower bound for uh, the sums of the lengths of the i k's. And in this I case, see. it's clear I that see. the lower bound uh, will be e. Mm. I, um, I see. So essentially, we are ignoring the 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 single points. Yeah, uh, in some sense, I guess. Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the 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 measure roughly roughly equates to uh roughly equates to being concerned with the continuous intervals of the of, of, of a set i guess yeah pretty much and like um if you have a bunch of of countable number of points then the union of a countable number of points will always have measure zero uh because i right, guess like right. you can think of it this way um i don't know I, i'm like also new to this but like if you have basically a countable number of points you can like give them an index right so i equals one two three four five etc etc uh mm. what you could do i think is you can consider a series of intervals um so the first one has length mm. lambda. The second one has length lambda over two. The third one is lambda over four, et cetera, et cetera. And if you were to like sum, sum the lengths of the IKs, you would basically get two lambda, right? Um, but then you can take mm. lambda arbitrarily yeah. small. So in this case, the infinite right. would be zero. So the measure would be zero. I see. Sure, sure. But if it was an uncountable number of points, you couldn't really do this argument. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. So the back to the Hilbert space up. Uh, essentially, we we are identifying functions that yeah. that uh agree on. Roughly speaking, of uh, accountable, uh, accountable set. set I, was, I I think the easy, the better way to say it is that they disagree on an countable number of points. They right, disagree right. on a countable number of points, and this uh. This allows it for like integrals of the type of integral f star f f f conjugate g dx to be sensible um, because we're doing defining this using Lebesgue integration. So if you have a function mm -hmm. that is non-zero on a set of zero measure, then the integral will be zero. So this is like well defined for the equivalence classes. I see. Okay. Um, so, like, we know that both of these spaces are Hilbert spaces. Um, I think the first, the case that the first one, proving closure for the first case, um, this the sequence space, um, which is a bit above case one, yeah, mm. uh, proving like uh, proving completeness for the first case is a bit easy. Uh, but proving completeness for the second case with the L two spaces is a bit complicated, and I don't want to mm. study that. Um, but like it's well known. Um, and you can also show, I think, that the two spaces are isomorphic. Mm. Um, but again, like I, I don't really know how to prove that yet, but like I think the way to prove this, um, I guess would be to prove um that basically um you would have to prove that the harmonic oscillator basis. So you have for the harmonic oscillator, you have the eigenfunctions by hand, right? Mm -hmm. You need to prove that this is a basis for L2. Oh, and by basis, okay. I mean that the span of the by hand, which is basically uh, the set of arbitrary linear combinations of phi n, mm -hmm. not essentially in the limiting sense, but like a finite number of the phi ends. And, uh, and then like, um, okay, so I have to like, okay, I've, I've, I've outdone myself. I actually have to define closure before I get there. But anyway, like we just need to show that the harmonic oscillator basis is a basis for L2, because in this case, mm. an arbitrary vector in L2 could be written as a sum uh, over an infinite sum of basically mm. Cn phi n. And the Cn would basically be like this could this then becomes a sequence space. Mm. Um so yeah, and this is basically um this is basically the Hilbert space that we deal with in quantum mechanics. Um, mm. but, but now I guess like this has been a bit of a detour. So, sorry, just to revisit, uh, going back here again, the, the reason we want to define the zero almost everywhere, the equivalence class, 
is because we essentially want the 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 Hilbert space to have a well defined inner product. Uh, yeah, inner yeah. Product. We want the okay. inner product to be positive definite. But if you were to not do the equivalence classes, you would have non-zero elements of the Hilbert space which have a zero norm, uh, which would be very bad. Um, I see. So okay. indeed, this equiv this equivalence class is necessary. Uh, I see. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I believe uh, Frederick Schuller has a nice lecture series on this on YouTube. So uh, this might, you might find this, I think it's under, oh no, it's not gravity, right? it's the quantum mechanics one. He actually talks about the, I like Frederick Schuller's lectures because he, he, yeah, yeah, this is the one. So these lectures are great because he, he actually, he's a very mathematical guy. He does yeah. physics, but he's a very mathematical guy. So he's really hmm. rigorous with all these, you know. Oh, I should take a look. I'm pretty sure he'll go over um, most of yeah. the things that I'm interested in. So yeah. yeah. I'll, drop you the, I'll drop it to you. The, so I guess there. like, uh, I'm going to like, I'm going to end today's podcast in about 20 minutes by um so, like surprisingly i'm going to explain a concept that would seem to be very analytic and very having to do nothing with physics but then i'm going to explain uh the relationship of this concept with a very surprising comment on quantum field theory uh in inflationary space times so um i'm going to scroll to the bottom um let's start from there okay so so i'm going to define something called a closure so uh, first, like, uh, assume that we have a, a subspace S um, of H. And, and this subspace is, is basically a complex vector space with inner product, but it might not be complete. Mm. So we define the closure S of C of S uh, as the smallest uh, closed subspace of H containing S. Um, sure. And Maybe we, an example would, uh, oh I, I'm gonna like give you how tell you how to explicitly construct this um okay, sure. okay so we def oh, so let's define the orthogonal complement of a subspace um okay. this is basically the set of states in the Hilbert space such that for some um, vector in S or any vector in S, basically it's normal to that vector. Mm, okay. So we see that S S is S ortho is closed. This is an exercise, but if you work hard, you can do this in your head. Um. And so we see that actually S perp S. So S perp perp is the closure of S. Oh. Okay. Um. Um. But I guess this uh this isn't entirely satisfactory for you yet. But I'm just gonna spit a few things. So like, oh, uh, and like also uh, just a bit of jargon. If C S equals if the closure of S equals the Hilbert space, then S is called S is says to be dense. Closure of space. Hmm. Okay, so now we're gonna like actually get to the fun stuff. So like, um, let's try something else. So let's not start with a Hilbert space. Let's just cover the complex inner product space. Yes. Then we can construct the Hilbert space. H such that H is the closure of S. And this is going to be we can do this construction uniquely up to isomorphism. Um, okay, so there are multiple, there are multiple 
is uh uh when you take the closure of s you define it to be the orthogonal complement of the orthogonal com complement of s right yeah is that process uh isn't that process unique no okay so this is different what i'm going to prove now is that if you have a complex inner product space then we can construct mm -hmm. a new hilbert space such that the closure of the complex inner product space is the hilbert space so that the so basically uh -huh. we're going to find the new Hilbert space so that the complex inner product space is isomorphic to a dense subspace uh -huh. of the Hilbert space. Um, I see. And and this is actually easy to construct. Um, and this is this is not going to take long at all. So basically, mm -hmm. um, okay. you can define the Hilbert space as the set of a set of sequences, um, where x n is in S. So it's the set of sequences uh, satisfying um that the set of Cauchy sequence actually so I'm just gonna uh yeah so okay so we're going to define the Hilbert space um, as basically the set of all Cauchy sequences um, with an equivalence relation. Hmm. Um, and that equivalence relation being these two sequences are equivalent uh, if is it x minus y n? Yeah. Uh, then xn minus yn going to zero. Mm. And yeah. let's see here. So the way I see this is uh, essentially this is saying x and, and y n converges, uh, converges, but just that there's no notion of convergence in this because we only have the, pro the Cauchy property. Uh, we don't have completeness necessarily yet. So this is essentially saying they're converging to the same number without saying they're converging. Right. So yeah, we're going this is like this definition is rigged so that um like you, you that you, we would get a unique limit for the helper space, essentially. Mm, I see. And yeah, this is it. Um now we can show and like you're basically going to define the inner product on this helper space as oh. oh actually well, that makes sense because we 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 previously had an inner product space that we didn't have completeness yet we didn't yeah. have a convergence but by defining the elements of the thing to be the, the sequences right where essentially yeah. we're saying the Hilbert space is the set of all limit points uh, yeah. but we're saying in a, in a clever way that yeah. uh, doesn't make use of the fact that such elements exist in s yeah I see. Okay, cool. And then we're basically like, we're going to define the inner product as so. And now you can basically prove all the things. You can prove that the new space is basically in Hilbert space um, and prove complete, um, which is nice. Mm. Um, now you can show that this is unique uh, by assuming, assuming that, uh, assuming, assuming that you, if you have a Hilbert space, you can show that you can write that Hilbert space as basically um, the set of all sequences, right? Um, all Cauchy mm. sequences um, with this equivalence relation. So you, you can actually prove that this is this construction is basically unique up to isomorphism. Um, mm. Okay, so, so yeah, and now, I'm going to briefly sketch what this means in cosmology. This is going to be pretty interesting. So, uh, so I'm following a re recent paper by Witten. Uh, uh, which one was that? What? Uh, I'm gonna just read. See here.
the let's see here. This was is it this. Is no it algebra regions and no, it's not. It's not that recent. Well, that's really recent, huh? Oh, that was uh, that was five days ago. <laughs> yeah. Is it analytic states in the quantum field theory of curved space time? No, it's a bit older than that. Let me check. Uh, it was, if I recall correctly, hmm. Ah, uh, wait, let me see. La, 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 la. Oh, yeah, it was, it was this one. So I'm going to be brief. Um, so in quantum field theory, roughly speaking, if you're going to come, uh, if you look at the classical field theory, and I'm talking about, in this case, I'm talking about free field theory, uh, you have a mode decomposition. Mm -hmm. So you have a bunch of modes. Mm. And each mode has like a set of operators. And each mode basically maps the set of operations in QFT, uh, basically a set of creation and annihilation operators. Uh, for basically, yeah. So basically K is equal to, uh, K is basically an index for the modes. So you have a, if you have like D modes, um, then that leads to basically D sets of creation and annihilation operators. So in this case, um, let me just go over something real quick. So we can consider a few things. So if it were to like, I'm just gonna like draw this in a way. Um, I'm going to, roughly speaking, you could, um, you could, I don't know, you can rank, yeah, you can like basically just like think of the modes as basically being parameterized by momentum or something or energy, let's call it energy. Could you like lower the screen down a bit? Um, this is vague, uh, but this is, okay. So like, so you basically have like energy if you think about it, there's like IR modes and there are UV modes. Um, and so let me just draw three different spectra, possible spectra. For the modes, the first type of spectra. Um, it's basically um, you basically have a discrete number of modes. Uh, this is the case for a closed universe. Oh, because finite, if you're, uh, briefly, yeah. yeah, because if it's finite and it has like if it's a finite size, then as you know, uh, for a finite size, say for a circle. Or a torus. Um, if you think mm. about the Fourier transform, um, then the frequencies are quantized. Mm. Um, but another thing you can consider is basically when the spectrum is continuous. Um, this is basically an open universe. Mm. Um, and well, okay, so a close and open doesn't really make sense. So I think like it'll, it'll be best to say finite and infinite, because. Uh, because this sort of like discreteness, uh, this is true for ADS um, because ADS is like a box. So it's like a particle in the box. Mm, and like, you. this is more like flat space. Um, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. Um, 
that's the case and i don't know maybe maybe like in some weird universe you could have like weirder spectrums but honestly and like I, i'm not being very rigorous right now so i'm just like talking about so maybe i don't know but like mm. but this doesn't matter so what i'm trying to say here is that if you look in the so i'm trying to say here uh let me go to a simpler example so the key here Uh, you have to, I'm going to like list a few facts. So the first fact is that if you have a, let's take, let's make this simple. So you have a creation operator and annihilation operator that's satisfying this. Um, you can create a new set of operators, A alpha, a, alpha A plus beta A dagger and is and is conjugate A star a conjugate A dagger plus B conjugate A. Um, and you can see that if you calculate if you calculate the commutator of the two, you see that you'll get A yeah, alpha alpha star must be beta beta star. So this is yeah. so if, if 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 this was zero then an arbitrarily new definition of operators could lead to a perfectly fine new set of creation and annihilation operators. This mm. is important. Um, so keep that in mind. That's the first fact that's going to be important. Mm -hmm. uh, the second fact that's going to be important, um, which I'm going to state like under that, um is okay so say that we anyway say that we basically have a set i'm just gonna like say that we just have like a set of an infinite set of creation and annihilation operators you can define mm -hmm. you can define a hilbert space by assuming that there is a state zero Cat zero, which satisfies a i cat zero equals zero for all i. Mm -hmm. And you can define the Hilbert space as a closure of the set of basically the closure of the span of the states that have a finite number of creation operators acting on basically the zero cat, which was defined above. Sure. So you would, if you're used to QFT, you would know that this is the usual case in QFT where you have like a vacuum state and you define the Hilbert space as basically the closure of the span of all the states that are given by acting creation operators on that state. Mm. Um, so is this, what was the small, uh, is there a small, is there a difference between the Fox space and the Hilbert space? They're the same thing. Okay, sure. Yeah, Fox space is just for multiple particles I suppose. It like, like don't, you don't need to care about multiple particles yet. I, that's not really important right now. That's mm. just like another, that's just an isomorphism on the Hilbert space. Sure. That's not, that's not important. Um, uh, but the thing is, um, okay. But imagine if we were to like do the type of transformation that I wrote above um, in number one, which is called the Bogoliubov mm. transformation. Oh, okay. Assume that we were doing a Bogoliubov transformation in all of these. Mm. Um, and assume that the index, um, uh, this index um, is not actually a countable one. Um, um, but whatever, like. Are we, doing, are we doing them individually or are we doing them um, as a giant rotation? Like, like, I mean, yeah, individually, just like, not... just assume that there is okay. some vocal of transformation. It doesn't really matter. Sure. Um, uh, so like, yeah, assume that we're about to, we were acting up all the of transformation. Um, well, actually, yeah, it doesn't have to be necessarily have to be, the index might, doesn't necessarily have to be uncountable, but anyway, let's assume that we're doing a vocal of transformation. Um, we define a new zero state 
um, as through this, and we define a new Hilbert space. Uh, closure of the span of bi, whatever, well, well, blah, 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 blah. matter. Uh, but the thing is, if there were just like a finite number of Bogoliubov transformations, uh, then basically h prime would be equal to h. But if there are too many mm -hmm. Bogoliubov transformations, that might not be the case. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. A good way to explain okay. this is that if you see, right, so a good way to explain this, it's very simple. So assume that you have the zero state, right? Mm -hmm. Assume that this is a normalized state. Um, mm -hmm. You could uh, uh, let's see here. You could attempt to calculate. Well, basically, uh, the argument is that this state, um, like. If you were to assume uh, that these two are equal, then clearly this state should have non-zero overlap uh, with some of the states of the form finite number of a daggers here. Um, if we were to do that, so like, this should be non-zero. Because if there were always zero, then, this thing um, will be in as, as perp, which would be equal to H perp, which would be zero. Um, so that will lead to a contradiction. Uh, are we applying, I, I, I'm, I'm not making this jump over here. Are we applying the A's to the right side, the, the right state, the cat state? No, so this is just the adjoint of this. Yeah, right. Then after that, are we applying the, are we applying, are we kind of. So just assume um, that this was like always zero. So assume that this was always zero. Okay. Then this state okay. cannot be in the Hilbert space, so it doesn't make sense. I see. Uh, if it's always zero, why can't it, wait, the S over here is the space of, uh, sorry, what's the definition of S over here again? Like this is a, like S is the one up here. And if you go up a little bit. So S is the. No, a bit down. Space. Yeah. Oh, oh, S is the space of. Yeah, okay, yeah. S is the span of all, and H is the closure of S. Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay, so S is the span of that. And the definition of orthogonal complement is that uh it's the definition of orthogonal complement is that uh, we're looking for all the we're looking for uh okay okay I mean okay okay yeah this don't make sense yeah so, yeah, if, so if this is zero for all for all of such states then this one is in the orthogonal complement by definition okay yeah but then if it's the orthogonal component it, like it can, can't be in the same over space so it doesn't really make sense um, uh, wait, so as the S orthogonal is, uh, is that equals to H orthogonal? Uh, H is the closure of S. Uh, if we take the orthogonal of both sides, um, so, so H is the closure of S, which implies that it is equivalent to. Right. Um. H, H, or dog, H, H, or, H, or, H orthogonal is equal to H orthogonals or uh, H orthogonal is basically equal to S orthogonal, 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 which is equal to orthogonal, orthogonal three times, right? And that's yeah. isomorphic to S orthogonal. Yeah. And why is H orthogonal isomorphic to zero? Oh, be because there's, oh, right, because the H is the entire space, right? There's no yeah. element of 
as uh, of H that it is because H that is an entire space, right? So yeah, you can't find any perpendicular. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. So if it if it was zero for if it uh had a zero inner product with all the yeah all the created states um then that would imply that this guy is zero, and that's not good because that would imply that we have no Hilbert space when using when defining it using this b yeah over here. So that that essentially means that that um uh h prime are we trying to show h prime is equal to h or h prime is they were, they're not, not equal, equal. To, we're trying to show that they're not equal for a huge yeah. number of b's yeah like because like if there are like way too many v b's like we could in in some cases where there are too many b's uh this could be mm -hmm. the case like so uh, every changes if this so like for every oh. Every for every Bogolyub of transformation that damps um this inner product. This one, this one, this one, mm -hmm. this one. So like um yeah. So for every Bogolyub of transform, that one is damped. So if you were to do an infinite number of Bogolyub of transforms, that will that one will be very damped. So um it will go to zero. So that might actually happen. I see. So so you're saying uh for a finite amount, right? This this guy might might not be zero, but for uh might might not be zero, but if as we add more and for more, for finite like, it's always non-zero, but if it's infinite, it might be zero. I see. Uh because for every one we add, it damps the thing, meaning it, it Yeah, what I'm saying right now isn't rigorous at all. I'm just sketching it like sure. um Oh, is it because uh, B is a B is a combination of A and A by yeah. So, so every time you add an A, it kind of kills off. Uh, yeah. Something along that line. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll we look into it. Yeah. yeah. That that type of thing could happen. So like yeah. Um. Right. Yeah. So that's okay. basically the reason. So the thing okay. is, like, if you want to define the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory in a unique way. Um, then you should, uh, then there must be some kind of criterion which stops you from making an infinite number of Bogolyubov transforms. Right. But the because thing is there- too many, then it wouldn't be unique anymore. Yeah, but there is like, roughly speaking, there is a criterion. If you like go up to like the spectrum diagrams or whatever. Like mm -hmm. if you go into the UV, and those modes like are like very high frequency. So they don't really care about the global structure of space time. So you can just assume that they're kind of like most in flat space. And in this in flat space, they're basically a good criterion um, for defining the creation and annihilation operators um, in terms of basically um, positive and negative frequency, like you usually do in quantum field theory. So the UV modes are not a problem. Um, the issue is with the IR modes. So as it turns out, um, if you have basically like an, a static, a stationary space time, then you have like a time direction, a well-defined time direction. Um, mm -hmm. So in that case, you can divide the modes into positive and negative frequency, and you can define the creation and annihilation operators in a canonical way. So the real issue, um, and if it's also a finite universe, it's okay because in that case, the number of IR modes would be fine, would be finite uh, because mm -hmm. of discreteness. So basically mm -hmm. it's okay if it's a finite universe and if it's a stationary universe, it's also okay. The key is basically mm -hmm. an infinite non-stationary universe. I see, and that's the case for inflation. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's our universe. Our, is it so you, or non-stationary? Is it, a, is it a all condition or is it an end condition? Um, I mean, like, there's cases, there's other cases. Um, but yeah, the clear thing is, if you have an infinite non-stationary universe, that's probably a sufficient condition 
I see. Um, that you okay. can't uniquely define the Hilbert space. I see. Okay, interesting. So yeah, that could be a problem for our universe. I see. I was looking at with Witten's paper. I didn't see any mention of Bergoglio transformation. So is it is it a related or yeah? Mm. Or do he use it in another another language? Like the I think it is probably above. Um I, I tried Googling, I tried searching for uh his paper for the term Bogoli both, but there isn't anything that showed up. Well, that's weird. But somewhere along the line there's probably an idea. Did you did mention Unreal? Yeah, I mean Unra is just Bogoli above. Um right, okay, so it's uh, pretty much the same thing. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so so one can one can prove that um we can't define uh is we can't really define a well defined uh quantum field theory on a, in an inflationary universe yeah. by using Hilbert space arguments. Right. Hmm. Um, which wait, is I just had yeah, which is which is weird. Hmm. Uh, I was wondering for these multiple creation and generation operators, is there a generalization of the Bogolio transformation that uh because if we think of the Bogolio transformation as uh, I'll just call it what one copy, it kind of it feels kind of like one copy of U1, just that it is a hyperbolic kind of uh U1. Okay, not not really U1. Um it, it just it just feels like it's rotating A and A dagger. Uh, yeah. in a, in a in some in some of a Lorenz way. Um uh yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, I, I'll just yeah, it, and, and then just now the, the, the transformation on that you did on the multiple creation analytic operators. Okay, I'll just call this uh B of one, right? Similar to U of one, like like similar naming convention. Uh, yeah, I guess it, you could say that. You did multiple copies of B of one, so essentially B of one cross B of one cross all the way on multiple copies of them, but is there a is there something along the lines of B of N where you kind of you could a oh okay is there a I think any just that's just a, just an idea that uh came to my mind right now initially I thought wait that isn't I this like thing. wouldn't this like be similar to I don't know the the symplectic group mm, probably probably yeah because it's, it's like B very it's like like it's it's basically um. The commutator um is kind of skew symmetric, right? Yeah, something along that line. Yeah, I think thinking. this is I think it's just I think it's just a symplectic group, I think. Can't be too sure, oh. but maybe something similar, something along those lines, maybe. Okay, yeah, we can I can look into it too. Yeah, yeah but I guess it. like yeah. Mm, but it's just I, a tangent, it's not really related to the roommate proof. Yeah. And I think. I think this argument, I'm not sure if there is a way to make this into a rigorous mathematical um, proof. I think like the way you would do, because like, um, yeah, I, I guess like you could make it, turn this into a rigorous mathematical proof. Is uh, this what Witten's paper is about? I yeah, but, but Witten was not rigorous. Um, but like, yeah, it's, he's rigorous enough for the sense of physics. Uh, mm. But yeah, it's really just about like this. Um, and then some other stuff too. Uh, so yeah, uh, I wonder what Witten's most recent paper is about. He seems to be doing a lot of quantum information slash functional analysis type stuff. Mm, um, is there any, any papers that make this, make this uh, argument with this? There have been a few recent review papers. Let me just like, uh, let's see here if I were to, uh, why not? I mean, it's always best to just study the math, mm. but there has been, it's very recent. 2302-01958. 2302. 
Interesting. Yeah. Oh, what's how, how are your how are your projects coming along already? It's going all right. As I said, like I am trying to do math. So hmm. uh like I know, like I've used like I know, I just like want to uh, study things that may not necessarily be cool, but are mm. but are useful in doing other things. Mm. I feel like sometimes the coolness of a particular theorem might be a bit of a trap because you you prove that theorem is cool, but you can't really do anything with it. I see. <laughs> yeah. But like I think the recent Witten paper is cool because I think it's like a covariant version maybe of like he, he he finally did it. He finally defined, I guess, what operators are in quantum gravity, I guess. Um, I, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but that being said, is it useful? Huh. Mm. Would it be would a mathematician be interested in this? Mm. Perhaps, but like. This is more like math applied to physics than physics that is applicable to math. But I don't know. Mm. I mean, it's okay. Witten, so it's obviously very good. Like, I like yeah. I like how like Witten is taking some of the very 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 vague statements of recent physicists and just like turning them into more precise statements. Uh, mm. But I'm not sure if this would lead to some kind of developments in geometry to the extent that like other topics like mirror symmetry have been. Okay. Will you say that you're more interested in uh will you say that you're more interested in physical mathematics than yeah. mathematical physics? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I see. I okay. mean like Those I, I like the... I... Yeah. Uh yeah, that's also my interest. I'm studying I mean I, I'm studying trying to study string theory, not because of experimental science, yeah. but more of uh I want to create conjectures. Yeah, but I guess you should really work on proving the conjectures. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> so my dream is to like rigorously define patent intervals because, mm. like, I don't know. Like, my opinion is that like path integrals are not necessarily integrals. Like, they have like some similarities to integrals, but they're not really integrals. Um mm. and and like yeah if you def if you rigorously define the path integral um that would be very nice mm. because the path integral is really cool um and it's like that but like yeah mathematicians hate path integrals but like mm. with, but as somebody who's been doing physics for a while I kind of feel like path integrals make sense in some way um mm. but only because like there are a set of rules to make to make it make sense and i think like if we were to take some of those rules under scrutiny uh, we might be able to understand something or whatever um, I see. so would it be right to say that uh, your your goal is to define the path integral in a rigorous way so that the nonsensical results that you get out of the path integrals they can be it can be made sense of you can say oh this is the reason why they don't want because they didn't satisfy this axiom yeah that that would be i guess and, that would and, be and like proof uh, stuff like we could prove mm. a lot of things you can prove all mm. the string conjectures if you were mm. to define the stuff that you were working with and i think okay. it's nice wait what was that guy's name again like the um, quantum mechanics lectures. Uh oh, uh Frederick Schuler. Frederick 
see them. Yeah. Is he a mathematician or a physicist? Um, oh, he's mathematics. He's, uh, mathematical physics. Yeah. He's extremely rigorous. Like he, he, he is. Uh, I, 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 I want to. I aim to be as rigorous as him. Um, yeah, I mean, like there is no such thing as more rigorous, because mm. uh, if you're do if in math you have to be one hundred percent rigorous, so you should mm. aim to be one hundred percent rigorous. The way he defined, like you know, when you uh, when you're doing uh when you're doing for example, uh, vector bundles where your vector bundles are representations of some Lie group. Right? Yeah, those are actually called associated bundles. Uh, yeah. For the longest time, for the longest time, I couldn't understand associated bundles because, uh, I, I couldn't follow the math that he was going through because they define, they define a product and then they quotient it out by some equivalence relation and it all got quite convoluted. But um, essentially, I eventually understood that uh, associated bundle is just a way of defining the action, uh, of a Lie group on the fiber, as a representation. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so rigorous to the point that, uh, honestly speaking, it, it made me a little bit confused. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I guess you just, uh, you just, yeah, I mean, like, rigor can be daunting, but you just need to, like, mm. use just the right amount that you need. Hmm. Yeah. Too much rigor and uh, it like, masks like, the intuition, and too little rigor and uh, you don't know what you're doing. No, with. no, like and in terms of like the theorems and the stuff you're like if you're if you focus on a very specific topic, uh, doing it hundred percent rigorously would just require you to state a few theorems, mm. uh, and it won't be that difficult. Um. So. Yeah, yeah, I think, right, I mean, I feel like I have to, like, I think a lot of assumptions, I, sh I should make, like, I, I should have assumed that the Hilbert space is separable, like the Hilbert space has a countable basis, that should have been mm. assumed, so, so you should make assumptions, like, you should make assumptions when you're sure that you're not going to, you're going to, like, you're not going to work with any quantum counter examples. You should make assumptions. Mm. Yeah. Wonder... Okay, thanks for. Yeah. Uh -huh. You go on, you go on. No, I think I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing this uh, very interesting idea. Um, yeah. Actually, actually, I will definitely uh, spend some remaining time looking through the. Lectures because I don't know once, once in a while I think this will be my uh fourth or fifth time trying to revisit it because every time I go maybe yeah. I can understand a, a lecture or more than the previous time but yeah, every time nice. I seem to get stuck at some point and then I just go and do something else yeah 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 okay oh look there's yeah, lecture then. notes right yeah there are there are. Where are, like are they on the archive too like I mean... Um oh, this is a nice this is a nice resource. I'm loving this. Yeah, it is awesome. Like it's, it's uh, it really it's kind of hilarious to imagine that I'm learning quantum mechanics all over again, but I feel like that's absolutely <laughs> necessary at this point. Um so, but here's what I'm gonna do. Like I'm I i do not really I try not to scare myself into thinking that I should study like all of a specific topic. Rather, I think it's nice if you just try to just sometimes it's better to kind of like be humble and focus on a very specific topic that will allow you mm. to not have to study too much too much for instance. Right. Whoa. Um. Hmm. Okay, cool. So he starts by defining banal spaces. Which one yeah. 
I think Bernard spaces are vector spaces with a topology on it. Uh, yeah. Then there's a there are two types of uh, he defined something. Actually, uh, they did they, they did they they even took a step back. Uh, they took a step back and actually defined. Let me check. Um, they actually defined before they defined. Uh, before they define an inner product. Yeah. Or was it? I think there's something related to norm and inner product. Like they are not they are not essentially. Uh, one you can define one using the other. Uh. But I think we going the other way, my there's a bit of nuance oh. involved around it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And apparently the bracket notation that we like to abuse the, you know, when you flip it around and you take the complex conjugate, um, yeah. that also has a bit of that also has a lot of uh, uh foundation. Mathematical foundation behind it, we just take um, it for granted. Um, uh, yeah, because I remember sometimes, sometimes I read it. Somebody was mentioning, uh, somebody was mentioning, is there a intuition for the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform? Uh, like why are they, why are they related by a negative sign? And then mm. I stated that uh, it made sense in bracket notation. Mm. Uh. And somebody, somebody uh, pointed out that uh, that was not true for a general uh, inner product space or something. Huh. Oh, yeah. I think it was, in, it was in the comments on my... Yeah, it was a comment in one of the Reddit posts uh, that I made. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Right, right, this is the one. Oh, but it's recently been deleted. Um, ah, yes, this is the one. So I was saying uh, somebody said that uh, the fact that the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are basically the same operation. And I said that uh, it's just a Hermitian conjugate of the bracket notation. And then somebody said it's only intuitive if you ever in Hilbert or Hermitian spaces. Uh, you can use it in reflexive Banach spaces and it's mm. duos, but flipping around is not just the Hermitian conjugate is actually a bit more involved. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know like, but, but, but like, I, like, to be honest, like you don't need to generalize that much. You can just work with over spaces, right? Yeah. Um, it's just that there's, that I, this made me realize there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of foundation that we, it would be important to understand it to get a bit of nuance. Yeah, but like, I think that might be misleading. My mm. opinion is that you don't need to know what a reflexive Banach space is. I see. Like, okay, like you just exactly. need you just need to know what the Hilbert space is. Like, I, like, I, like, mm. unless you're gonna use reflexive Banach spaces, why bother? Mm. Maybe another day. Yeah. You know, that's always yeah. like that's always my philosophy. Maybe another day, but not mm -hmm. not right now. I have other things to do, mm -hmm. and like they they take yeah. time. Yeah, after you get tenure, then you can go. <laughs> Study I mean, that's just way, that's way too far. But like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for today's uh, meeting. I learned a lot. Yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah, it helps me too, because like talking about stuff really like helps me mm. put things in perspective and it, hel it helps me like create my lecture notes, which I am trying to do. Um, oh. Are next... you doing any uh, teaching assistant by the way? Because as I understand it, grad students usually are their TAs as well. Well, no, not really. I, I, I would not like to be TAs because if I have to be a TA, oh. okay, let me stop recording.